People in our own backyards are hurting. There are insecurities around food, economics, mental health, access to justice, health care, and our society continues to become more divisive. But there is hope. Right here in Chicagoland, there are people and organizations who are on the front lines working to bring about positive and transformative change. Each week, we're going to meet some of these agents of change and examine how they are spurring innovative ideas and finding solutions to push our society forward in a more just direction. I'm Sufyan Sohel, and this is Change Agents. Good evening and Ramadan Mubarak to all those celebrating this holy month. May be filled with countless blessings, peace, and reflection. This month, I've been thinking a lot about conflicts around the world. In Gaza, in Ukraine, in Sudan, and in so many other places filled with unimaginable darkness and terrors, and where thousands of people are dying and trying to flee violence, oppression, persecution, and war. The United States, for many, has been a symbol of freedom and hope. And during the past five decades, the United States has resettled over three million refugees, making it one of the leading countries in the world for finding new homes for those who are escaping those horrors. President Donald Trump had lowered the annual cap of refugees that could be admitted into the country to 15,000. Under the Biden administration, the numbers have increased with over 25,000 refugees arriving in 2022. Refugee arrivals during the 2023 fiscal year dramatically outpaced the prior two years, reaching over 60,000 from October 2022 to September 2023. In the United States, a refugee is someone who is from a foreign nation who can demonstrate that they were persecuted or fear persecution due to race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or based on their membership in a particular social group. Just in February of this year, Chicago saw refugees from Venezuela, Myanmar, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Syria, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Nigeria, Somalia, El Salvador, Guatemala, Colombia, Burundi, Honduras, and Sudan. That's a lot. <laughs> and upon arrival to our city, they face so many challenges from navigating the U.S. and Chicago education system to housing to economic freedom and language access. Refugee children face even more difficulties due to their minimal understanding of the English language and, as a result, the inability to perform well in school because they cannot read, write, or do basic math problems. Forging Opportunities for Refugees in America, or FORA, was formed in 2019 to help these impacted youth learn and thrive. My first guest tonight is a specialist in literary education, particularly for those acquiring literacy late, who founded Fora with her husband. Currently, she serves as the full-time volunteer director of education at Fora. I'm so thrilled to welcome Dr. Kathleen O'Connor. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. I'm happy to be here. I'm really happy to shed light on these amazing students. Oh, thank you. Let's take a step back. and I talked about refugees and people fleeing from all over the world due to a number of issues at war, persecution, famine, oppression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they're trying to find safety for them and their families and they're traveling. What are some of the challenges when they come to a country like the United States or a city like Chicago, which are welcoming countries at, at face, but what are some of the challenges they're facing that you see? So many challenges, and let me say that I think your introduction was perfect because one huge challenge is that our amazing city is challenged to find a place for these people. We have so many who are coming, they deserve shelter, they deserve safety, they deserve love, and we risk getting overwhelmed so that we might run out of that love, and that would be such a terrible thing. Um, so at Fora, we seek to address the problem that refugee families face when they have been denied access to education. For many refugee children, that might come because their lives have been so disrupted by war and violence. But for some groups of refugees, their oppressors have specifically targeted them and used denial of education as a means of keeping them limited, keeping them isolated, and preventing them from ever becoming part of modern society. 
Um, for example, the Rohingya people who come from Myanmar or Burma, uh, the UN considers them the most oppressed people in the world, but many of us have never heard of them. And for generations, for decades, they have not been considered citizens. So they're born stateless, they have no access to government services, not human services or the protection of laws, they can't enter government buildings, including schools. So they have no experience with literacy and their parents and grandparents have no experience. So when they arrive, they might be in fifth grade and ninth grade and they end up going into the grade based on their age. And there they are in a classroom with a teacher who's tasked with presenting grade level curricula and they don't know quite how to hold a pencil with the proper grip. They don't know how the number system is organized in tens and they don't know how an alphabet really works. And with no one at home to help them with these kind of foundational skills, uh, they are really stuck. Those are things we take for granted, right? Yes. Like grouping numbers in tens and even how to hold a pencil. And I don't even know when we may have learned that growing up. Um, are there specific groups that are more targeted than others? You've mentioned, you know, like women, for example, mm -hmm. are, are systematically in, in a lot of places left out of the education system. So they're at a leg behind. Are there other groups that you... Well, as I mentioned, the Rohingya, we yeah. have a lot of Rohingya that we serve at Fora. Also, the Afghan people, particularly, of course, Afghan girls, because the Taliban has targeted them. But all the children who we see coming from Afghanistan, or I should say most of the children we see coming from Afghanistan, their education was severely impacted by the years of war. Um, and even though they may have been working with us as our allies, in many cases that meant they were in rural spaces, sure. um, in the places where the war was the most active. So when their children arrive here, they're years behind in school. So it's not just a matter of not understanding English or not being able to navigate the education system. All those, those are huge barriers. It really is that fundamental absence of a literary foundation. Yeah. Wow, I didn't, you helped me understand that better, thank you. Why, what resources currently exist, if any, in our school systems to support students like that? Well, one remarkable and wonderful resource is the ESL program. Sure. Uh, what that looks like for most students is a maximum of two hours of specialized instruction in English language learning. Uh, first of all, two hours for many of these students is not enough. And second of all, that teacher then is, is teaching students how to speak English, how to communicate, and that's for kids, many of whom did have access to school at one point, and their parents had access to school. So even though they might be behind, they do understand the basics of an alphabet and how that works. So for these particular students, they're not getting enough instruction because, again, the ESL teachers have a curriculum that they need to deliver, and it's not, uh, they don't have the resources to assess each student's needs at this foundational level. So what happens? I'm a fifth grade student by age. I come from uh, one of these countries. I don't have these basic foundational skills. I'm in fifth grade, enrolled in fifth grade class, but I have no idea what they're talking about. Do I fail? Or do I drop out? Do I, what, what, what are you, what's happening with these students? Well, I can tell you for many of the students that we work with who have been in the school systems for approximately a year, we have right now a lot of Afghan students who we've received after being in the schools for about a year. And I have students maybe who don't recognize an equal sign or really know what it means, sure. even though they're enrolled in Algebra One, So they've been attending that Algebra One class without really understanding. So they may be able to memorize a lot of things uh, to do something that might look like uh, learning, but it's not that meaningful education that we're going for. I have another student who maybe was confusing the small letter E with the letter S. To her, they were pretty much the same letter. Uh, another student who would look at the letter P and thought that it would be f, f, f. Um, And these are the kind of things that you can't get in a big classroom yeah. where the teacher is trying to teach 
a very different curriculum. So what we do at Forest provides something called high impact tutoring. And what that looks like is students come and work with one-on-one, -on -one, most of the time one-on-one, -on -one, with a volunteer tutor who's trained. Uh, and we provide them with a series of learning activities that are targeted to them and their individual learning level. And those activities are going to be based on research and they're designed to help students get the foundations of literacy and numeracy quickly so they can really make rapid progress. And what's so amazing is then they can really participate in their CPS classrooms. So they're teachers who are working so hard and I'm telling you, our Chicago Public School teachers are some of the best. Agreed. And once the kids have some of that in instruction, that basic one-on-one -on -one instruction, they can really begin to shine in schools. And that's what I think so many people don't appreciate how much untapped potential these refugee children have, how far they can go, and how much fun it is to be a part of the experience of teaching them and you know watch them learning to read. I can see the joy on your face as you're mm. talking about it, and I appreciate the shout out to our public school teachers. I, I think they're often blamed or criticized for um, how our children grow and learn sometimes, and uh, um, but just there's not always enough resources to devote one-on-one -on -one to all the students. So we, as a community, rely on organizations like Fora uh, to help bridge some of that gap. So five years, what made you want to start this organization? Um, uh, there's so many answers to that question, but the most important thing to realize is that when you come to work with these kids, you just become so full of hope. Uh, my husband and I have a long history uh, working overseas and working here uh, in Chicago with displaced persons, with uh, asylum seekers that at one point would be housed in our home as guests. Uh, but once we began working with the refugee families from Myanmar, the Rohingya families as mentors, we began to see that although they were great at learning English, at getting jobs, at you know extending, um, building networks in the community, it was very difficult for their children. And I have a background in child psychology, so I could see exactly how much of an uphill battle, how much of a challenge it was, given the the way that they had been treated in their home country, this effective denial of education, um, for them to make that up here. And again, the Chicago Public Schools are doing an amazing job. This is just really too much to ask. So by providing this, we are able to see them thrive, and it just gives me so much joy. So that I don't feel overwhelmed by all that terrible news you were discussing at the beginning, because um, it's very present with all of us. We feel it. Um, but when you know that you can do something every day that changes the trajectory of children's lives, that is restorative justice, it fights that long-lasting childhood trauma that results from you know, war that seems far away and overseas, but really the effects are felt right here in Chicago today. So it gives me hope to be with them every day and see how much they can do and learn and how, how much they grow. Oh, that makes me so happy to hear. And I appreciate you contextualizing that what happens in different places has hard effects here, and especially to the youth that are impacted. They carry some of that uh, for a long, long time. Um, I was about to ask you what makes you keep doing it, which you, you said that because of the hope that uh, you're filled with. But can you just share, uh, as, as we wrap up, uh, just some words for our viewers to make them want to engage and get involved with uh, our refugee communities. Anyone who comes into our building will immediately feel how much energy and hope there is. Our donors and our volunteers are part of a community that is every day providing restorative justice to these families. We uh, work to teach children how to read, and when you see the children learn that skill and get excited about it, it's a wonderful thing. One thing that happens is there's a trap that kids can fall into, which is when they struggle in school, they believe, oh, maybe it's right. Maybe all the things I've been told about how I don't belong in school, how I'm not good enough to do well in school, maybe that's all true. But when we teach them, oh, no, you can do this, you know, it's, it's fighting back against that, those racist lies. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. 
Thank you, Kathleen. I learned so much tonight and appreciate the love and commitment you have shown to support our refugee youth and families. Sit tight, we'll be right back with our next guest. Hi, I'm Bianca Cotton. Join me Mondays at 7 p.m. for Behind the Confident Smile as I sit in conversation with incredible, dynamic, and complex Chicagoans who peel back the layers, living lessons, the joy, and the pain behind their confident smiles. You can watch on CanTV19, CanTV.org, and CanTV Plus app. My next guest tonight learned to read at the Northtown branch of the Chicago Public Library and has spent years mentoring refugee children, specifically young STEM-oriented girls in and near the Westridge neighborhood where she lives. Currently a doctoral student at UIC, pursuing an advanced degree in pharmaceutical sciences and a volunteer with Fora, I am so excited to have with me Ms. Naba Khan. Thank you for having me. Of course, you're a volunteer, you're doing your PhD. What aren't you working on right now and how do you find time to balance all of this? Um, I am doing a bit of both, Okay. a bit of everything actually. I have a family, I'm the older daughter, so. The responsibilities taking, Yeah, so I have a uh, responsibility my brother, looking after my parents, my work, my school, and then Fora indeed is something you can't forget. So a bit of everything, but it's important. That's why is it important for you? I feel like it keeps me going. It's like, my motivation factor. Um, the reason why we came here as a family was because to get education. And so if after so many years, if I don't use that education for the right purpose, I feel like I'll be wasting my time. And so now that I'm in pharmacy school, I'm doing my doctorate in, in pharmacy. I just feel like I've come a long way and it's time for me to put all that into use and definitely spread it across. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, tell me about your journey. Mm -hmm. What brought your family? We were talking a little bit earlier, your immigration yeah. story a little bit and how you got connected to Fora in the first place. So we were in Pakistan, I was born there, um, but my mom actually had a kidney transplant. So as we all know, third world countries are struggling with the healthcare system. So my dad decided that it's best that we move her to the US where he was originally. So he applied, we came here in 2010, and that's when I started my whole academic journey, my whole character buildup, and overall my identity. Um, so as we were going, 2018 was um, 2018 after graduation. And starting my first year of my associate's degree in 2019 was when I just came across Fora in summer. It was very small and I was walking with my mom after grocery shopping and I was like, what? My mom was like, what are you planning on doing for the summer? So I was like, maybe something near so I don't have to commute. And then I saw David, he's one of the employees at Fora. He was sitting by the door and there were kids around him. They were reading books and my mom was like, well, you were doing that at the library. At that time, the library was closed. So they're like, my mom was like, you can definitely pinch in and ask them and see if you can give them your time and just enjoy here and volunteer like you normally do at the library. So I stepped in and I asked and they were very happy to have me there. Um, we, you know, at that time, there were very little kids just from the community themselves. They were just playing in there, having like cookies and their TV screens. And I was like, this doesn't really, you know, look like, an, like a library, like a community center. But it was, I was like, I'm, I'm willing to give my time because I love the kids right when I stepped in. It was everything that I wanted to do for summer that I was doing, so I was like, I wouldn't miss the library as much. And that's how I came across Fora. And what, and that was what, six years ago? Five years? I guess, yeah. 20, five years ago? 20. So what has, now we're five years later, what keeps you still engaged with them? I think the children themselves. Yeah. Um, I live in the community, so I've been living there for the past 14 years. I never move, hopefully in the future. But um, when you see them in the streets, when they call your name out, when they, look up to you when they're going to school, when I'm going to school and I see them with their moms, right? Like grocery shopping or something. It just feels very nice to be known as a mentor. I don't know if they see me as a mentor, but definitely as a role model. Um, Cause we relate all the kids, not just girls, but boys too. When they look at my brother, when you know their moms look at my mom, I feel like it's, uh, it's a sense of like uh, identity buildup that we're passing on. Um, and we're doing that by giving love to the kids that are at Fora. And that's the reason why I'm there, because I see myself in every girl that's there. Talk to me about some of the challenges that you and now you see some of these young children face upon arrival to the country. What are they navigating? 
Right, so as Kathleen mentioned prior, um, the language barrier is the biggest challenge that we all as immigrants, refu refugees face. And I think the second biggest one is emotional support. We lack that when we first come here. Even if we don't come from a war zone, if, if we don't come from persecution, I feel like somewhere in there, we have that lack of support that we need on a daily basis, which cannot come from our families. Um, I personally feel like when we step out to schools, as like a, I started as a fifth grader, I see a lot of the girls in Fora as, and boys too. They, they're starting school, they're so excited to, like fifth grade is like that children to now you're being a little bit more older, right? You're getting closer to that eighth grade mark than high school. So I feel like when they're stepping in that, like, and they don't understand what they're doing, when the teacher is just continuing on and on, and they're like, well, you know, I can slow down. I think Fora is the place for them to slow down. And that's how I relate to them. I'm sure that's how they relate to me because when they tell you their stories, the first thing you remember as an immigrant um, is that, well, I, I went through all that. Lang language was the biggest factor. I didn't, I was also in ESL classes and I was also doing two years. I did it till eighth grade because my English was very broken, um, but I was practicing at home. So, you know, I, I feel like if Fora was there in my time, my English would not would be much more better than it is now. Because I do feel like some, some of the sounds that I make, like the V versus the Ws, I have problems with that and I cannot fix it now. I've come too far, so I'm like, I'm not going to fix that anymore. But I just feel like, well, if I had Fora there, um, something very small, something where I can get like a one-on-one, -on -one, I can share what I'm feeling on a daily basis. People are, you know, students sometimes get bullied or maybe they get a, like a comment on how they dress, right? When we come from another country, I personally never realized like, well, this is how you're supposed to dress. I was always in the traditional clothes. I went to school like that for my first few years. Um, and then as I started to understand, we kind of moved on from that. But that's the same for these kids. Like when they go to school, they wear the hijabs. I don't wear the hijabs personally. So it's like they would come to us at four. I'd be like, well, you didn't have a good day. Why didn't you have a good day, right? And the first thing would be like, well, I didn't feel good today. And they didn't feel good because they weren't comfortable in a certain situation, probably because something their friend said or a question that was asked, but they didn't have an answer to it. And I feel like I was in those situations every single time. Yeah. So that's, these are the two main barriers that I feel like we work on at Fora aside from the academics. No, I think that's so important, both the education and the language as well as the emotional support. A lot of communities come from, com from societies where even that emotional support isn't part of right. um, that fabric of the culture, which, right. and the kids need it to grow mm -hmm. and thrive, especially in a country like this. I, I love the VW comment. Yeah. My mom <laughs> living here 40 plus years sometimes <laughs> still slips into it. I'm and, so, uh, you know, and uh, it's, it's, I think it's adorable. And, uh, you know, I make fun of her in the most loving way sometimes right. when that happens. I appreciate you sharing mm -hmm. that. Now, as we wrap up, how can people watching get involved how can they come and volunteer with Fora? what would be the best way to do that the first the first and foremost step is to <coughs> just walk into our doors um i think once you walk in you will feel that you need to be there in some way some shape or form um it's not necessary to you know spend your time there but i feel like if you just step in work with our kids just hear their stories talk to them ask them a question their answers will make you feel like you want to come more and more and more. And I think that's where it starts for every volunteer for that we have at Fora. You know, they come in and they're like, well, we want to come back because we have free time. That's what you can do. You can make connections. And I think those connections go a long way. That's why volunteers do come to Fora all the time. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate all that you've shared and your commitment to this group and, and the community. And I think setting the stage that we all want similar things living here, no matter where we're from, uh, whether from abroad or even born here and whatever our stories are. And it makes me so proud and inspired to see leaders, young leaders like you continuing this work too. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you again, Naba. Uh, sit tight, we'll be right back with this week's Change in Action. Hello, I'm Rich Roberts, inviting you to join me for the series Soft and Tender. Soft and Tender celebrates the resilience and emotional depth of black fatherhood, offering a powerful narrative on family bonds and ongoing challenges faced by black communities. As a father and as a parent in general, you have to know that you're not going to always understand, and that's okay. Tune in on Can TV, cable channel 19, or stream at CanTV.org or the Can TV Plus app. Experience the power of community television.
Tonight in Change in Action, we will meet the 18th Street Development Corporation, which was established in 1976 to respond to the housing crisis that impacted the predominantly Latino community of Pilsen. They began their work by providing local residents with the information they needed regarding their rights as tenants and homeowners, and now they offer so much more. Hi, my name is Jaime Garza. I'm the events director at ESDC. ESDC is a local nonprofit in Pilsen. It's Economic Strategies Development Corporation. It's been around since 1976. Our holistic approach to helping entrepreneurs and small businesses to help them navigate the difficulties in starting a business in Chicago. We have consultants helping out people either starting their business plan or doing the market research. And we even go as far as, as helping uh, businesses with their visual identity. A lot of the legal work or a lot of the planning or a lot of the market research, those are the kind of things that we either teach in-house or we work with our partners from all over the city to provide these either workshops or uh, share skills from other businesses that have been through the challenges. We also market the neighborhood Pilsen as a whole so that economically is supported by either local tourists or world tourists. We have special events. One of the examples of special events is Mole de Mayo Festival. This year is our 15th annual. It's a three-day outdoor festival. Pilsen is known because of its, its Mexican heritage and mole is one of the staple foods in any Mexican household. So we celebrate it by having a festival and feature local businesses, artisans, musicians, painters, and activities for kids and adults and help bring vitality to the neighborhood through these arts. If you want to reach out to ESEC or myself, you could go to www.ESCChicago.org. You'll find all the work that we do, or you could just email me directly, jgarza at ESCChicago.org. Thank you, 18th Street Development Corporation, for your efforts to enhance the socioeconomic well-being of Chicago communities, businesses, and individuals through your programs and your services. Thank you to Kathleen and to Neba and to Fora for your unyielding passion and commitment to educating and empowering our refugee youth. As we learned today, these children are facing war, oppression, famine, persecution, and so many other horrible realities and moving to a new country for the hopes of freedom, safety, opportunity, and education. They are so eager to learn and to create a better future for themselves and their families and struggle with things that you and I may take for granted. I am so grateful for organizations like Fora who are meeting this critical need to empower and support our refugee children. Please do explore ways on their website that you can support and get involved. Malcolm X said that education is the passport for the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. While we do not know what will happen to any of us tomorrow, having an education under our belts opens the door to more opportunities. Education prepares us for what's yet to come and hopes for a better tomorrow. Ramadan is also a season of loving, of giving, for helping those in need, and I ask us all to think about what we can do to support those around us, to open our hearts and to find ways like Kathleen, like Naba, and the team at Fora to give back to, support, and empower our communities. We can all be change agents. Let us all be change agents. Thank you, my friends. Have the most wonderful evening. <laughs>